Nowadays, we are more and more surrounded by new technology. ETAIN is a project that wants to advance knowledge about exposure to electromagnetic fields. The project conducts research in three different areas. First, effects of electromagnetic fields on humans. Second, effects on insects and pollinators. And third, we'll try to understand a bit further which are the effects on the planetary health. This webinar is the first of a series of four that will help us understand further the scientific research. In this first chapter, we will learn more on foundational aspects on the topic. We will also understand which are some common assumptions around exposure and we will understand which are the objectives of the project. Hi everybody, my name is Anke Hus. I'm an environmental epidemiologist from Utrecht University in the Netherlands and I'm coordinator of the ETAIN project, which is about the exposure to electromagnetic fields and planetary health. The reason why we're doing this research is because we've had this change in technology from 2G, 3G, 4G and now 5G. And 5G means that there's also new frequency coming, but also new ways of using this technology. And that also means that there's a different and change in the way that we are exposed, that organisms are exposed, and that um, the radio frequency electromagnetic fields have an effect on organisms. In previous times, especially for the beginning of the technology, we were very much interested in, for example, brain tumors. Um, but nowadays, with the higher frequencies, the interest has shifted much more also into effects that maybe um, have the root much higher in the, in the body surface because the higher frequencies mean that most of the exposure will be absorbed actually in skin and on the surface of the body. But that also means that there's an interest now towards very small bodies, especially insects, and this is also what Etain wants to target in this project. The objectives of ETAIN are to interact with stakeholders, to think about and develop exposure reduction um, technology, and to put our results into a planetary health uh, framework. So another important part of the project is lab research, where we try to understand if there are any biological effects that could also translate to um, impact on humans. So in this part, uh, we are looking into effects on cells, especially skin cells and eyes, but we also do research on fruit flies. Another part that we are working on very hard is to develop a tool that helps us to understand and how far exposure can be translated into dose. So dose is the concept that we know what is the exposure inside of the body and that is relevant to understand any health effects. So regarding insects, um, we hope that uh, in this project we understand what uh, the symmetry is of the insects, so the dose that the, the insects actually experience and what that means to insect um, biodiversity but also to their survival, fitness, development um, and insect health. One of the major aims of this project is to develop an app and that app um, has the aim to be able to determine one's own exposure. So people should be able to download the app and then um, do their own measurements and in particular understand better where their own personal exposure comes from. So the idea is here that people will understand better um, what their exposure sources are and therefore will have um, more power about their own exposure sources because um, these can then also be influenced. Another aim of this app is to understand better what the spatial distribution is. So where do we have which kind of exposure um, in our area and how is that changing over time? The last part is maybe the most challenging one because we are doing research on an app and an exposure in people and we do research on in insects and we do research in the lab. But then we need to bring everything together. And this is the concept of planetary health, where we try to understand how do we put everything of these different elements together and, and how do we have to understand the complete picture. But what are radio frequency electromagnetic fields? What do we know about their impact? What is the science advances so far? 
Well, the truth is that there's a lot of uncertainty around the topic. Some people say it's harmful, some others say it's not. So we definitely need more research to add clarity to this important topic. My name is Martin Rosley. I'm an environmental epidemiologist and working at the Swiss Tropical and Public Health Institute. What are radiofrequency electromagnetic fields? Actually, we are exposed to many different electromagnetic fields. Visible light is electromagnetic fields. If something is hot, it radiates infrared radiation. There's UV radiation and there's also radio frequency ma magnetic fields. And this is a certain frequency range that is used for communication and for heating mostly. Why are radio frequency electromagnetic fields relevant for health? It is well established that high levels of radio frequency electromagnetic waves heat up the body or any other tissue like animals. Um, this is, can be very dangerous and this is taken into account in the regulatory limits. What is less clear and is whether there are effects which are below the regulatory limits where there's only a minimal heating which is not thought to be dangerous. And that is actually important to look closer into this potential low dose effect. For example, people think that with the advent of 5G things are getting worse in terms of exposure because of more data, more speed, less latency and generally better connection. But this is not always the case. No, it's not the way it works. In fact, the 5G antennas, instead of transmitting in circles, they transmit directly. What is actually new with 5G? Uh, let's remember that mobile phone technology is developing now for 50 years and it's a continuous development and about every 10 years the industry is saying now we have a new standard, a new generation and now we have the fifth generation 5G. But actually this does not mean that it is completely new things. It's just a further development. There are a few things that are new. There are new frequency that are used. There are new antenna technologies that are used. For instance, that the antenna do not emit in all directions like this. They emit more direct to the user. So this means that people who don't use mobile phones are less exposed. It's also more efficient in terms of energy consumption and it also uh, has a lower standby emission. So if nobody is using mobile phones with 5G, exposure will be lower. At the end of the day, it's actually not the technology which is relevant, but the applications. Just remember when the smartphone had been introduced, this was not the new uh, generation. This was an application and this has changed our life totally. So I think to some extent 5G is overestimated in terms of what it means for health, but we should be very careful in evaluating what new applications are introduced and what do they mean for health. What is the motivation to develop 5G? Basically there are three main motivations. There are more and more people using mobile technology and there's more need for data transmission. So it needs a better, more efficient system that can transmit more data. On the other hand, there's also a need to have more transmitter connecting very few information, very low level, like sensors, Internet of Things. So that is also an application of 5G. 5G will be able to connect with many thousands uh, devices at the same time. And the third motivation is to have faster communication. So for instance, you can do uh, self-driving cars, you can have uh, robots. So, so for instance, a medical doctor can work at home and make an operation with a robot because the, the communication is so fast that, that actually uh, this, this would work. A lot of people think 5G has higher frequency, but this is actually not true. 5G can be used on any, any frequency. To some extent, higher frequencies are used because this allows to transmit more data. But there's also 5G applications at lower frequency than we had used mobile phone before. For instance, at 700 megahertz. And this is very useful for low data transmission on a large geographic area. When I look for information, when I ask people around, it's really hard to get certainty about these topics. For example, I don't know how, what should I do in terms of how should I keep my mobile phone. I don't know what's going to happen with the 5G, with more and more objects being connected, with a lot of data volumes being transmitted over the internet in wireless technologies. 
I have no idea what that would mean in terms of implications for exposure. When it comes to exposure, I think there are two main important points to consider. How strong is a transmitter and how far away is it? Actually, if a transmitter is doubling the distance between a, a human being and a transmitter, then the exposure falls by a factor of two. So if you have the mobile phone one centimeter away from your brain or 10 centimeter away from your brain, it's a factor 10 in the exposure value. So this makes quite a difference. And that is why even if the mobile phone is a, not a very strong transmitter, it contributes quite a lot to the daily exposure because it's operating very close to the body. There's two types of um, radio frequency electromagnetic field sources. There are these sources which are called the far field sources. So these are mobile phone base stations, radio transmitter, TV transmitter. Usually they are far away from the body. And then there's this transmitter which are closer to the body, uh, like mobile phones, cordless phones, tablets on the lap and, and things like that. People around the world protest the rolling out of 5G cell towers and satellites, including right here in San Diego. What I know is that there's a lot of uncertainty around 5G. It's really hard to get a certain opinion about 5G. If you look online, there's a lot of contradicting opinions based on the scientific approach they take or some beliefs that some people may have. C'est de demander de, de dire non à l'irradiation forcée there's quite a few misconceptions when it comes to radio frequency electromagnetic fields, which is not surprising because you cannot see them. And one question, for instance, is the further away you are from a base station, the lower is your exposure. Sounds plausible, isn't it? Because we know if the distance to the base station is increasing, then actually the exposure is decreasing. But this is only half of the truth. The other point is that a lot of people use sometimes a mobile phone and if a mobile phone is far away from a mobile phone base station and if there's wall between and the connection is bad, the mobile phone has to transmit with much stronger power. And because mobile phone is such an important uh, transmitter close to the body, this makes at the end for most people actually the majority of the exposure contribution. It's really surprising to realize that the mobile phone is highly dynamic. It can the emission power can be a factor of one million higher or lower depending on the connection quality. Think about one million. A year has 500,000 minutes. So if you use your mobile phone during one minute with the baddest connection you can have, you have the same type of exposure as if you use it for a full year with very good exposure. Is device use really the highest exposure contribution? Yes, this is true. It's really the own devices for an average user, and an average user is maybe five minutes using a mobile phone for calling per day, maybe one hour um, doing uh, internet uh, activities on the mobile phone. If such a person is usually higher exposed from the own devices than from the environmental sources like mobile phone base station or radio transmitter. It is often told that with 5G exposure will increase a lot and there's more base station needed because higher frequencies for some part of the 5G and uh, we expect that indeed there will be more 5G base station. But on the other hand, because there is a denser network, they also have to have less emission power and as explained before, they are more directed to the user. They are not broadband transmitting, they are more more narrow beans so that on average actually it is not so clear whether the exposure will really increase. A lot of people think it would be good to lower the regulatory limits, then we have lower exposure. Sounds very plausible. If you lower the limits for a car um, that makes noise, then you have less noise in the environment. But actually this is not what's happening with mobile phone communication because the source of mobile communications are the user. So if you lower the limit, you just need more base station to, to capture these people and to have connectivity. So at the end, maybe you have a little bit less of these peak values at some rare points, 
but on average, actually, it seems not to change a lot whether their limits are higher or lower. That is what we have seen in measurements in Switzerland and other European countries when we compared the levels between uh, countries with different levels. One other assumption is that the higher the frequency, the more dangerous. But I think this is also a confusion. The higher the intensity, then it's probably more dangerous. But the frequency does not tell you anything about how strong the field is. And the point is, the higher the frequency in the radio frequency range, the less penetration into the body. So if you use a mobile phone call with a higher frequency, like the current 5G 3.5 gigahertz, and make a call, you have six times less exposure to your brain compared to a previous generation mobile phone uh, where you use one gigahertz, for instance. This brings us to the end of the first webinar. The next chapter will be about the effects of radio frequency electromagnetic fields on insects and pollinators. Keep up with the advances of the project by following us through social media and at our website, which is itainproject.eu. Thanks and see you soon. Thank you.